It is the first day of school for San Antonio's biggest school district. How Northside ISD parents and students feel about being back in person. $3.1 billion, that's the new city budget, and it's the biggest in the city's history. We're going to tell you where that money's going. Well, we're in the middle of a mini heat wave and it'll feel near 100 degrees over the next couple of days. But some subtle changes bring us slight rain chances by the weekend and we'll also have a check of the tropics coming up in a bit. Live from KSAT 12, the news at noon starts right now. San Antonio police say it looks like speed played a role in a deadly overnight crash. They found a woman who was badly hurt behind the wheel of her car after it hit a building just west of downtown. This happened on South Laredo Street near South Brazos. And as Katrina Weber tells us, despite all paramedics did to try to save her, the woman still died. They worked feverishly, but their efforts were futile. Even before paramedics tried life-saving techniques on a driver, they knew the chances of survival were slim. San Antonio police say the woman, who was in her late 20s, had no pulse when rescuers reached her after cutting through the window of her car to free her. They all answered a call about a crash shortly before 3 a.m. Then they found her sedan smashed up against the loading dock of Mission City containers in the 1800 block of South Laredo. Investigators spent more than an hour trying to piece together what happened. You can tell from the markings that investigators made on the ground that the car originally was in these westbound lanes. For some reason, it crossed the road before slamming into the loading dock. Initially, officers at the scene said they weren't sure what caused the driver to lose control. A later report said investigators believe she was speeding. Family members who stopped by the scene told us off camera that the woman was on her way home from another relative's house at the time. They believe she may have fallen asleep at the wheel. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Investigators say a man who overstayed his welcome at a friend's apartment is now behind bars. Take a look at 52-year-old John Savala. According to an arrest affidavit, he had been staying at a friend's apartment for several months, but then last Monday, his friend said it was time for him to go. She tried to kick him out of the apartment, and then they got into a heated argument. As she left, he fired a shot. She was not hurt. Savala was then arrested and charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Funeral services for a Bear County Sheriff's deputy will begin next week. Deputy Floyd Cardenas was an 18 year veteran with the Sheriff's Office. He worked as a SWAT operator and head trainer for the BCSO K-9 unit, according to Sheriff Javier Salazar. He passed away in his sleep last week. He was 41 years old. A public viewing will take place next Monday from 5 to 7 p.m. at Mission Park off Cherry Ridge. The funeral will be next Tuesday at Community Bible Church beginning at 10 a.m. We earlier reported that these services were to start today. That is incorrect. Again, it will be Monday and Tuesday of next week. The proposed San Antonio budget is a record $3.1 billion. It's expected to be adopted on September 16th. And as Max Massey tells us, people all around San Antonio are going to be able to see some changes. Infrastructure is a big thing. There's a lot of potholes. We walked around downtown San Antonio talking to residents about what matters to them in the proposed budget. Mental health being assessed for the unsheltered. You know, I work down here with a lot of unsheltered population and mental health is a big crisis. Mental health here in San Antonio is a big part of this proposed budget. And going along those lines, another big part is responses to emergency situations. One area that we're going to do something a little bit differently is in the mental health calls and where we'll have a, a team of a, a, a police officer, a paramedic, and a clinician respond to those mental health type calls because it's not just a police issue. And we want to be able to solve those on a long-term basis. City Manager Eric Walsh spoke with us and he explained the reasoning behind the changes to these calls. Uh, so we spent time this year, uh, 27 meetings with the community, meeting with the officers and trying to identify what calls for service do we not need to have a police officer go to? Barking dogs, loud music, fireworks, and, and have other city departments respond to them. This budget was formed during the pandemic, so obviously health care plays a big role. A renewed investment in public health, right? Um, and I think that to a certain degree, public health departments in this country are going to be a little bit like fire departments after 9-11. We're doing the same thing. But it's not just the current city that the budget plans for. Our population is growing. 
fast. It's a great place to raise a family. To address the increase in families, there are already talks about a future 2022 bond for infrastructure. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. We have an entire breakdown of the budget, including the numbers that you need to know and a copy of the 48 page proposal. You can check it out right now on KSAT.com. The largest school district in San Antonio, Northside ISD, had its first day of school today. Northside, one of the handful of districts that adopted a temporary mask mandate last week as COVID-19 cases continue to rise here in the city. Sarah Costa spoke with the parents and students at Broccoli Elementary School about how they felt about being back in person. He was about to be staying home because of this, but I think we're pretty good. Christine Stock says she was about to keep her little one starting kindergarten home, but once Northside ISD mandated masks last week to start the school year, it made her feel better about sending her son River into the classroom. The little ones can't get vaccinated, and what do we do if they can't, you know? Broccoli Elementary School had about 80% of its students back for in-person learning by the end of last school year. This year, Broccoli, along with all Northside schools, will be doing all in-person learning. One of those students coming back is fourth grader Landon Deerson. He spent a year and a half at home for virtual learning. Being in virtual, um, you don't get to see your friends at recess or um, like talk to them. But in person, you can go see your friends at recess and talk to them. Landon's dad said it was a tough decision, but necessary. He wanted to go back to school and we talked it over with mom. And the school's, you know, doing the whole vaccination thing. We're vaccinated, so we wanted to see. Plus, give him the opportunity to, like he said, see his friends, because he was shut in pretty a lot of the year. For the nervous students or parents returning back on campus, Broccoli Elementary School principal wanted to make sure all students felt comfortable as soon as they got off the car with Mickey and Minnie Mouse greeting them from the front of the school. From the time that they exit their car when they get here, they're excited, they feel the magic, we're able to do so much with the magic theme and hope that we can instill some magic in them. And of course, Mickey and Minnie have been a hit here here at Broccoli Elementary School, taking away any first day jitters. I'm Sarah Acosta, KSAT 12 News. It is also the first day of school for students at Somerset ISD. And after a year of mixed learning environments because of the coronavirus pandemic, Somerset ISD officials say students will see some changes. First off, this year classes will only be offered in person. Next, student teachers and staff will all be required to wear a mask while inside any school building. And finally, both students and staff will be able to take advantage of a mental health clinic. Superintendent Dr. Saul Hinosa says he's very excited the district will be providing this new service. This is a way for uh, uh, students and staff members, if they are having any type of emotional or physical uh, uh, issues, uh, we can provide wraparound services to them. Dr. Hinosa says that this idea comes due to the struggles families and students experienced during the pandemic last year. He says the district's main goal is to keep its students and staff safe while offering students a top-notch education. Now to the crisis in Afghanistan. President Joe Biden due to address the nation in just a few minutes. Yesterday, he also spoke to the nation and said U.S. troops could stay past the August 31st deadline to ensure that all Americans are evacuated. More details coming on that in about 20 minutes, but in the meantime, ABC's Julia McFarland has an update. Just over a week before the deadline for withdrawal from Afghanistan, evacuations from Kabul stepping up as new threats emerge to Americans and Afghans trying to escape. We have a long way to go and a lot could still go wrong. President Biden addressing the nation, warning of possible threats from ISIS. Every day we have troops on the ground. These troops and innocent civilians at the airport face the risk of attack from ISIS. With thousands of U.S. citizens and tens of thousands of Afghans who helped the U.S. all still needing to be pulled out, every hour counts. Altogether, we lifted approximately 11,000 people out of Kabul in less than 36 hours. It's an incredible operation. As the clock ticks towards next week's deadline, the British Prime Minister is expected to call for an extension at tomorrow's virtual G7 crisis talks on Afghanistan. But it's a proposal that's been swiftly rejected by the Taliban. If they are intent on continuing the occupation, so it will um, provoke a reaction. The pandemonium outside the airport not letting up. 
As thousands of Afghans gather by the airport gates, the chaos and confusion makes it a dangerous place to be. A NATO official confirming at least 20 people have died in and around the airport since last Saturday. And among the seven Afghans killed over this weekend, it's emerged that one of them was a two-year-old girl. Reports she was trampled to death. And this morning, a firefight at the airport, leaving one Afghan soldier killed and several others wounded after an unknown hostile actor opened fire. U.S. CENTCOM confirming that no U.S. or coalition forces were hurt. Julia McFarlane, ABC News, London. Again, President Biden will be addressing the nation in about 20 minutes. After a long time waiting, James Bond back on the big screen. We're going to give you the details a little later in the spotlight. And the Spurs just a few weeks away from training camp. We've got a look at some key dates from their 2021-22 schedule coming up in sports. 22 people are dead and more than 20 missing after flash floods swept through Tennessee this weekend. Amazing pictures. We're going to take a look at the cleanup effort as well after the break. At least 22 people are dead, dozens missing after a flash flood swept through areas of rural Tennessee. Community leaders still trying to clean up all this damage from the water, but also to find those who were swept away in those waters. ABC's Elwin Lopez is in Tennessee with that story. Just to show you how powerful these waters were, these cars and buildings, some of them came from blocks away. The rushing water slamming them together, pinning them against this bridge. The community here devastated after receiving more than 17 inches of rain in about 24 hours. Now they say that flooding is to be expected in this area, but nothing like this has been seen before, according to some of the residents here. Now we spoke to one neighbor who said that he was able to pull a couple from a home just 30 minutes later. They saw their house wash away before their eyes, and now the community is picking up the pieces. People are still missing, and that tough search for survivors picks back up again this morning. Elwin Lopez, ABC News, Waverly, Tennessee. Horrifying pictures there. If you don't have respect for a flash flood by now, that should help you get there. The statistics from that Tennessee flood are incredible. Absolutely, numbers are just unbelievable. Yeah, and you know, more than 17 inches of rain in less than 24 hours. And coming up, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the meteorology behind what happened and compare it to floods here in San Antonio in the past. But for now, let's take a check of the aquifer. The aquifer is down seven tenths of a foot over the past 24 hours, still above the monthly average by three feet, though. So doing all right in the aquifer level. Molds are low at 290. We haven't had much rain over the last several days and that's why molds are low. Let's go ahead and take a look at the heat index close to 93 degrees out there. It's only going to get hotter. Today is the CPS Energy Peak Energy Demand Day. Reduce your use from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. I'll be right back with a look at the weather. We're pretty dry here. We could use a little rain, but boy, we don't need anything like Tennessee got. You know, looking at those pictures just broke my heart because I know this just, it came out of nowhere. It's devastating. And you know that here in San Antonio, if you've been here long enough, you can relate to that kind of flooding uh, through that small town in Middle Tennessee. So let's talk about why that happened. Well, first of all, here's a look at the radar loop from Saturday. A stationary boundary set up. Now imagine the hardest rain you've ever experienced for more than a few hours. And that's exactly what these people in Middle Tennessee dealt with over a period of time because of that stationary boundary. Look at these rainfall estimates. A bullseye here of almost 17 plus inches of rain. So for this flooding event, they got more than 17 inches of rain in less than 24 hours. As we've just reported, unfortunately, over 20 fatalities with more than 20 missing. Now let's compare that to uh, the October flood here in San Antonio of 1998, where we received almost 16 inches of rain, so a little bit less, in 
five days. So they received more rain in less than 24 hours than we did during that horrible flood of 1998 when we lost 31 people in our community. So a devastating flooding event through Middle Tennessee. Here in San Antonio, though, we're going to have a quiet and hot day. It's 87 outside right now, but it already feels like 93, and we've got only a few cumulus clouds out there right now. Otherwise, it's totally sunny. A valley, Del Rio, Eagle Pass out there. Temperatures are even warmer. It's 89 in Del Rio this afternoon, and the heat index, the humidity feels like uh, 93 degrees. But as we head into the afternoon hours here, we're going to be dealing with the heat index of about 100 to 105 with a high temperature of 98. So it is going to be a hot day for us, and tomorrow's forecast looks pretty much the same. It's quiet across uh, most of the United States, with the exception of the Northeast and New England. They're dealing with flooding and even some tornado warnings across parts of Massachusetts in Connecticut because of tropical depression on re as it falls apart and moves across the uh, uh, New England area. Meanwhile, heat high firmly in place here in Texas, and this is going to build uh, over the next 24 hours or so. So we're going to have very similar weather in the next couple of days where it'll be hot in the afternoons with the heat index 100 to 105. Temperatures go down slightly by Thursday through Friday, but it's still going to be humid. Another thing from Thursday into the weekend is that there are going to be a few coastal showers as that heat high moves a little bit more to the uh, north. And so we really only have a 20% chance for an isolated shower or thunder shower uh, Thursday through Sunday, but at least there's a small chance for rain right now coming up in the next half hour. We're going to be talking about how there's the potential in parts of uh, the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico to see a tropical system uh, this time next week. And that makes sense because we're seeing a ramp up of uh, tropical storm activity, which this is the typical time of year that we see the peak. So we'll talk about that a little bit later in the show. Uh, but for now, just know that it's going to be hot and humid next few days with only a small chance for rain by the week's end. Ursula, David. Thank you so much, Sarah. Still to come in just a few minutes, a look at the Spurs schedule coming up. Talk about a rough start. Ooh. And are you ready for some football? High school ball is here. A look at week one schedule. The San Antonio Spurs have released their 2021-22 regular season schedule, and if they are going to break the string of two straight years of not making the playoffs, they've got their work cut out for them. That's because they are without their leading scorer, DeMar DeRozan, who chose to sign with the Bulls, and court leader Patty Mills, who decided to sign with the Brooklyn Nets. That means the Silver and Black will be led by 24-year-old starting point guard DeJounte Murray. This year, with no so-called star power, they could use a little, so hopefully he'll grow up to be that star. Look at the start. October 20th here at home, Orlando, and they play Milwaukee and L.A. and Brooklyn back in, in January on 21st. That's when we welcome Patty Mills back, and then on January 28th, we welcome in Chicago's own DeMar DeRozan now. And welcome to week one of the high school football season. It has been a long time coming after last year's was so affected by the pandemic. So far this year, all teams scheduled to kick off on time. If there are no last minute changes, here's how the season will kick off Thursday night in San Antonio and South Texas. Let's talk about a blockbuster start to the year. Brandeis is going to meet O'Connor at Ferris Stadium. Two teams that used to be in the same district before Brandeis was moved to 28-6A due to the crowding of schools in that school district. Man, there's less schools in there. Even though this is a non-district game, it's still a great way to get started with a new coach, Charles Bruce, taking over the Broncos this season. And of course, KSS Sports will be live at Linoff Stadium for the debut of our partnership with Texas Sports Productions for their first live game of the season on MeTV. It's going to be Madison taking on Clemens. In fact, you can see all of their live broadcasts on the BGC app each and every week starting this Thursday. But some of the biggest games in the state will be staged here in San Antonio. That's when the top ranked team in the state from San Antonio area, Brennan, number 17, will host Reagan, who is listed as number 19 in Class 6A by State Football Magazine. And they collide right here Friday night at Ferris Stadium. You can also watch the best of BGC and 12's Top 12 on Sundays on instant replay. And even though football is starting, the missions are still in action. After two big home runs, the missions were 
finishing off the series with the Corpus Christi Hooks last night on a high note. The final score there was 3-2 to two with the win. San Antonio improves to 45-50. The San Antonio Missions have the day off, and then they begin a six-game homestand against the Midland Rockhounds tomorrow. High school football, we are thrilled. It's going to be fun. fantastic. So. After over a year of postponing it, James Bond is making his way back to the big screen. We're going to tell you more about it in the spotlight. We want to get you caught up on the pandemic and breaking this morning. The FDA now granting full approval to the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. The question is, how will this affect vaccine hesitancy? ABC's Alex Brashe has the latest from Washington. This morning, the FDA gave full approval to the Pfizer vaccine in people 16 and older, a potential game changer in the COVID fight, as it could convince more Americans to get vaccinated. It also could impact vaccine requirements. This is a pivotal moment for our country in the fight against the pandemic. While this and other vaccines have met the FDA's rigorous scientific standards for emergency use authorization, as the first FDA-approved COVID-19 vaccine, the public can be confident that this vaccine meets the FDA's gold standards for safety, effectiveness, and manufacturing quality. More than 80 million eligible Americans are still unvaccinated. 31% of those who haven't gotten the shot say they would if it was approved by the FDA. The daily case average in the U.S. is at 137,000, up 230% in the last month. Experts fear those numbers could increase. More than 87,000 COVID patients are hospitalized around the country. Many areas running short on hospital beds and nurses. The never ending story. And the biggest question is when is this going to stop? Meanwhile, the Biden administration is discussing plans for booster shots for Americans starting the week of September 20th, despite criticism from the World Health Organization and others that the U.S. should not offer booster shots to Americans while many countries lag in vaccine access. We have to protect American lives and we have to help vaccinate the world because that is the only way this pandemic ends. The CDC sets a meet on boosters tomorrow. So far, the U.S. has donated more than 120 million vaccine doses to other countries, and it's committed to donating 500 million. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. Analysts are now saying that hospitalizing unvaccinated people is costing the U.S. healthcare billions of dollars. The Kaiser Family Foundation report found that the average cost of a COVID-19 hospitalization is around $20,000. The foundation also looked at government data and they found that 113,000 hospitalizations could have been prevented in June and July. That means more than $2 billion could have been saved during those two months if those people had been vaccinated. The foundation says these figures are likely an understatement of the entire burden on the health care system. In today's headlines, today is New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's official last day in office. His resignation taking effect at 11.59 p.m., right before midnight. And then Tuesday morning, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, soon to be Governor, Kathy Hochul is set to be sworn in. Cuomo announced his resignation two weeks ago. He's facing impeachment after the state attorney general released a report finding he had sexually harassed 11 women. Cuomo has denied all of the allegations, saying he never touched anyone inappropriately, but did acknowledge that some of his behavior made others uncomfortable. House Democrats taking on infrastructure this week. One of their first acts of business could be a vote on a budget resolution for the president's spending package that could happen as soon as tomorrow. The sweeping legislative package would pass under a budget process called reconciliation. It would not be subject to the Senate filibuster 60 vote threshold, but a group of nine moderate House Democrats are holding that up. They want to first pass a separate one trillion dollar bipartisan infrastructure deal that the Senate already passed. And so the cleanup is already beginning after tropical depression Henri hit the northeast uh, part of the country this weekend. Heavy rains quickly turning into rushing floodwaters on residential streets as creeks and other bodies of water were just overloaded. In the town of Helmetta, New Jersey, more than 100 people had to be evacuated from their homes and many of their houses are now in unlivable condition. 
We have had some reports of several homes with severe damage, um, foundations, 10 foot, 6 foot sections knocked out. A lot of moving pieces to the puzzle right now and um, ultimate goal is to keep our residents safe. I have not been able to get back to my house. Railroad Avenue is completely flooded still and I don't know what kind of shape my house is in. My car was probably underwater, so I'm in pretty bad shape right now. <laughs> Authorities in the area are also checking homes to make sure they're safe and stable enough for the residents to return. As millions of children head back to school, many are facing the reality that the pandemic is not over, which has school districts looking at ways to address students' mental health. ABC's Karen Travers has given us a look at what schools are doing to help students and what parents should look for. I'm feeling excited and I'm nervous. American kids are heading back to the classroom for the first time since March 2020. Experts say the COVID-19 pandemic has raised new challenges for educators. A new study found that 36% of parents say their child fell behind in social and emotional development. We've recognized that with this pandemic, we've had a new pandemic of mental health issues among our kids and the isolation that they have felt, you know, the virtual learning environments that just do not provide the same level of support to our kids. The Fanyon family in Woodbridge, Virginia is gearing up to send three kids back to school. I'm excited to see like all my friends. I'm excited because I miss having a routine. Justice and Jenna told us how their teacher checked in on students during virtual school. In the morning, we would have like this chart thing and they'll ask if like what different color we are and like red will be like mad stressed out and stuff like that green was like i'm okay doing good mm -hmm. my last period teacher he was always like what did you guys do today did anything stress you out schools across the country are looking at ways to address students mental health Iowa is using $20 million in federal COVID-19 relief funding to launch a new pre-K to grade 12 school mental health center. In Montgomery County, Maryland, mental health will now be accepted for excused absence. Experts say teachers should consider starting the year prioritizing social emotional learning skills. I think it would be a mistake to on day one, jump right back in doing academic assessments. Doctors say parents and teachers should pay attention if a child is more withdrawn, less interactive with peers, and struggling to focus or keep up in class. But experts also emphasize that kids are resilient and just getting back into the classroom will make a big difference. So I think their, their personalities are going to um, come back a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. Karen Travers, ABC News, Woodbridge, Virginia. Looking outside with live cam, pretty day out there. We keep having these nice days, and I was telling Sarah a little bit earlier, it's nice having a little breeze mixed in with all that heat. Oh, definitely, especially in the morning hours. You know, it's nice to be out there before it gets too hot with a little bit of a breeze. And I want to point out something with our live cam real quick. If we look outside, we're seeing a lot of cumulus clouds. Now, these are called fair weather cumulus clouds because they indicate fair weather or uh, weather where it's not raining. And you can see just how shallow these clouds are here, right? They don't develop in the vertical. We need them to develop in the vertical in order to produce rain. That's not in the cards today. Instead, it's just going to be a hot one. It's 87 degrees outside right now. And Ursula was mentioning the breeze, but the winds are calm at the moment. They'll be a little bit more breezy in the afternoon, though, uh, hours. Uh, heat index already of 93. So it already feels like it's in the low 90s. And today we're forecast to hit 98 in San Antonio, uh, 96 in Yavaldi, 99 in Del Rio, 98 in Pleasanton. But the heat index will be anywhere from 100 to 105. And so CPS Energy has issued a CPS Energy Peak Energy Demand Day. They're asking us to lower our energy use between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. One way you can do that. Avoid doing laundry during these hours or avoid running the dishwasher during these hours. Just some ways to help save our grid a little bit of uh, extra stress that it has today. It's not only hot here, but it's hot across the entire uh, state of Texas as well. Now coming up in the forecast, we're gonna talk about our heat wave continuing, a small chance for rain, and we'll take a look at the tropics, which uh, we're really gonna be paying attention to by this time next week. David, Ursula. 
They're creepy and kooky oh, yeah, and all together it, smooky. Well, you can do that. See, they're creepy and, and they're kooky. kooky. They're, they're all together spooky. <laughs> and they're coming back to theaters this fall, sort of. It's always good when we have Sarah on the show and we yeah. have to sing. We'll give you the details in the latest Adam's Family Moving coming up in the spotlight. And experts are saying you might want to start your holiday shopping early, like right now. We'll tell you why after the break. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar News. Disney released some streaming numbers from its Black Widow debut. The media giant says they brought in $125 million in online revenue from its streaming debut, and that outperformed other Marvel films. Disney released those figures in court filings after the dual release that prompted a lawsuit from star of the film, Scarlett Johansson, that over her payout for the film. Meanwhile, the price of Bitcoin crossed $50,000 over the weekend, rebounding from its months of lows. The most valuable crypto hit a three-month high on Sunday, that after they saw their price swing between thirty and forty thousand dollars over the last few months. You now, Bitcoin is seeing its price rally. It is still down significantly from its all-time high of sixty-five thousand back in mid-April. And General Motors is expanding their recall of the Chevy Bolt electric vehicle that over fire concerns. GM now recalling seventy-three thousand bolts from the twenty 2020 twenty through twenty twenty-two model years. Previously, the recall only applied to twenty seventeen to twenty nineteen models. The company cited fire risks due to rare manufacturing defects in the electric vehicle. The new move will cost GM an additional billion dollars. They plan to seek reimbursement from their battery supplier, LG Chem. And that's your Cheddar News Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. Also in your consumer news today, you may want to get an early start on holiday shopping this year and expect to cough up a little extra for gifts. That's because the shipping crisis is getting worse and it could be meaning higher prices for shoppers and retailers. The disruption of the global supply chain since the start of the pandemic has spurred a shortage of products, and that means fewer choices and higher costs. And you know, if you're trying to get through the day every day through this heat, um, it would be nice to think that, hey, it's Christmas shopping season. <laughs> At least mentally, right? Right, me Every, yeah. You know, It'll cool so things down a couple of degrees. Right, right. And you know what's some good news here is although the aquifer is down seven tenths of a foot, it's still three feet above the monthly average. You know, usually in August we're in stage one water restrictions, all of those things. So we've had some really healthy rains over summer, so things look all right as far as the aquifer is concerned. And without the lack of beneficial and healthy rainfall over the last couple of days, we've been able to see mold fall and mold is now low at 290 and it should stay low over the next couple of days or so because our week of heat and humidity is going to continue. That's what's up with the weather, but we will see some subtle changes by the end of the week. And I'll have an update on the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico where we're going to need to be watching by this time next week coming up in the forecast after this. So you're talking about Christmas shopping, making you feel a little better about the cold. I specifically, I'm going to bring this, I specifically remember a guy standing out in his yard when it was nine degrees, minus 13 wind chill, talking about August. That remember we that would admit, yeah, yeah, a remember lot of people probably are not uh -huh. going to complain about it any uh -huh. heat issues this year yeah. <laughs> probably not you know we still <laughs> technically have not seen 100 degrees yet at the mm. airport but that's a technicality because it feels like 100 out there in the yeah. afternoons anyway uh, but 87 degrees outside right now winds are generally calm and we've got a heat index value of 93 degrees uh, but outside at jbsa randolph it's 88 87 in new Braunfels, 88 in stinson 91 in pleasanton and 98 in del rio 93 in Catula, 91 in Kennedy, and 91 in Gonzales. Meanwhile, the heat index value is anywhere from uh, 100 to 105, so uh, going to be that way this afternoon. We're already starting to see it feel like it's almost 100 in Pleasanton at the moment. It feels like it's almost 100 in Catula, too. So for the rest of the day, keep that AC on. It's going to be toasty. Uh, we'll be looking at a, a high temperature of 98 this afternoon, southeast winds at 5 to 15, and we'll be pretty 
pretty mild this evening after the sun sets at around 8.06 uh, this evening. Meanwhile, on the radar and satellite imagery, we've got very quiet weather across much of the United States, which with one exception being, of course, the Northeast and New England, where tropical depression Henri is slowly starting to push east, but it's already been producing flash flooding in parts of Massachusetts, Connecticut, even some uh, tornado warnings in parts of Massachusetts as well. That's going to be moving out back into the open Atlantic uh, by about Tuesday. Otherwise, we've got a heat high in place uh, with uh, sinking air in place. So whenever we have a high pressure system that creates sinking air, it prevents uh, clouds from developing in the vertical, which in turn prevents rainfall. And so we'll be looking at that heat high, really maintaining its strength uh, just around Texas through about Wednesday. So through about Wednesday, we're going to have potential high temperatures near 100 degrees. Uh, so it's going to be hot for a good portion of this week, especially the first uh, section of this week. And even by the end of the week, we are still going to be toasty. But with that heat high moving to the north, we're going to open up the atmosphere to a few coastal showers. Uh, and again, the chance for rain is only about 20%. Uh, but still, the small chance for rain is there. Then by this time next week, we're really going to have our eyes focused on the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. We are in the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season, and uh, because of that, uh, a, we'll be paying really close attention. There's an area of uh, low pressure just right there near the Lesser Antilles in Trinidad and Tobago. It's going to be pushing up into the Caribbean Sea, and it, right now it has about a 30% chance of developing into a tropical system in the next five days, but I expect that number to be going up. And through about Sunday and Monday of this next week, we're going to watch to see if it can cross over the Yucatan Peninsula and enter into the Gulf of Mexico. After that, though, there's no real way yet of telling where it, this potential system could be headed. So continue to check back in with us. We'll have a few coastal showers, as I just mentioned, Thursday through Sunday. And then beyond that, we'll be focused on the tropics. Other than that, hot temperatures will get down into the mid 90s by Saturday and Sunday, but it's still going to be just as humid and feel just as hot with heat index values all week long, anywhere from 100 to 105. Ursula and David. Ouch. Mm. Bond. James Bond. Could you ever do that? Could you ever say that like like one of those James Bond guys? You could, you know, you go right for oh, it. Go James ahead. James Bond. Back in theaters, James Bond is. We'll tell you about the latest installment in the 007 series coming up at the spotlight. Bond, James Bond.